Lord, I know that you love us. I know that your grace has been bestowed upon us. And all of us right now know that you're here. You're not up there or down there. You're right here with us. And I believe, Lord God, your presence is here. I ask your presence to be in my son, Ryan, that you'll give him the words to speak. And that you'll be in us that we might hear that still, small voice in our, in our ears that speak into us about your will. Bless us, we pray, through Christ our Lord, the living word. And everyone said, Amen. 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 So, uh, the passion with which I feel about these particular words that I feel called to speak um, has not matched the enthusiasm of my mood this past week. It's been a mellow week, kind of, uh, I would say melancholy, but I don't, just a mellow week. So usually, like, um, if we were to, if, as a coach, if we were to seem a little flat, we would all get up, and we'd start doing something, we have to do jumping jacks, coach, what do we have to do right now uh, to get me going? But I am gonna pray that the Holy Spirit uses me in this moment because I do feel very strongly about the words that have been given to me this week. And I am feeling, even now, as we talk, and even after that, um, that worship, I'm feeling my spirit start to sing. You ever need worship? Just need worship. You're like, I have had a melody. I need to be recharged through worship. You know, and, and Pastor Don has used this example a lot, and it's so true that worship is really where God gets to clap for and say, well done, good, faithful servant. God is the audience that we are worshiping with our hearts. But nonetheless, sometimes we need right. to worship God because in the context and in the moment and in seizing the moment of worship, something beautiful happens, something profoundly spiritual happens where the Holy Spirit comes in us and all of a sudden our hearts feel lighter, our spirits uh, seem to, to soar just a little bit brighter. So I am going to begin today with what God has put on my heart. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And Jesus said to them, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. <coughs> Two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. And I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Lord, this sermon is meant to be a voice of encouragement of all the things that we have uncovered over these past nine months now, since we started, all the things that have been laid before us in these times together, to journey back to those moments, back to those things that we, we dreamt about, and be encouraged here today. Amen. Amen. In life, there will be on occasion moments of great monumental significance. It passes by, and if you don't jump at the chance, you miss it. The train, right? People get ready. There's a train a coming, right? You don't need no ticket. What do you do? You have to just jump on board. 
There are moments of eternal significance and that train passes by and if you pause too long, that train passes right on by. Two roads in the woods. Sometimes that train looks like the one less ridden. Sometimes you wonder if that's the type of train that's going to get me from point A to point B and then on to point C, D, and E because there's a lot of other trains that look a lot faster, a lot flashier. They may even serve the Starbucks coffee on that train <laughs> and just the 8 o'clock coffee on the other. I'll go with the 8 o'clock. He loves 8 o'clock coffee. I don't know why. <laughs> but in life, these moments of great significance are moments where the decision between stale familiarity, put that in your brain for a minute, stale familiarity, comfortable uncomfortability, between that and life-changing adventures of faith lie in the balance. It's a hike in the woods with a Matrix-type moment. If you don't know the movie The Matrix, just follow along with me, where you can take the blue-squared path from tree to tree, and it will lead you right back home with nothing changed and everything intact, just the way you left it, or you could take the red colored path and it takes you to the wonders of the promised land and you will see how deep the rabbit hole of faith goes. Which one do you choose? Familiarity, even if it's stale? Comfortable uncomfortability? even if it just reminds you of something normal? Or do you dare to hop on the train and risk the adventure of faith? Do you know this faith that we have is meant to be adventurous? That's why Paul and so many of the writers of the New Testament tell you that in faith you can do things you never thought you could do. You could hike to summits you never thought you could hike. Illustration just came to my mind. The first big hike I ever did was with my wife. And she wasn't my wife at the time, but we went up to where she's from in the White Mountains, and we, white, and we hiked uh, Adams Jr., right? Not Adams, the senior Adams, but the junior, <laughs> in all the presidential mountains. Yeah. I only got to junior, but as soon as I got above the tree line, you know what happens when you get above the tree line? You know why trees don't grow anymore? Because there's a lack of what? Oxygen. Oxygen. As soon as I got up there, my legs started cramping. Remember that, Nick? I couldn't even walk. I was like, I don't think I could take two more steps on these stones. And she sat there going, wow, wow. You flatlander, you. You flatlander. Get going. Right? But the spirit is oxygen. It's the breath. We just sang it, sweet wind, to bring you to summits that you never thought that you could make it to. But faith is an adventure, and adventure is a risk. Faith ought to be something risky. Because if it's not, and it's just something that makes you comfortable, you are missing out on all the wonders that God might have for you. You won't even know when you, until you meet him one day, right? All the things that he may have had planned for you, but you have to see faith, not as something that sits you in the comfy recliner with the feet up, but as something that's like a chair that propels you out of the seat and gets you hiking towards the summit top. Will you take the blue path and come right back home and sit back and put on your favorite episode of whatever? Or will faith cause you to take the red path? and risk the journey of faith. You have to make a decision. A decision that only you can make because life in faith, brothers and sisters, is standing at a crossroads. At every moment and at every turn, Jesus presents us with a crossroads in life. And sometimes those crossroads are of eternal, monumental significance. I have chosen the path less traveled, the small gate, the narrow path that leads to life, and it has made all the difference. But you have to be willing to set out where others have not set. You have to be willing to go where others haven't gone. You have to be willing to go to the places you don't think you can. Because faith and life should be adventurous. Faith should propel you and not just recline you. Encountering ministries, that's all of us. 
since June. In an attempt to encounter the author of life, the clockmaker, the redeemer, the hope giver, the restorer, the life changer, the lover of our souls, we have been asking ourselves to consider God's call to make life altering choices for the kingdom of God. Let me just go back a few months to the courage to take joy when happiness seems like it's being taken away. The courage to choose peace, Pastor Don, when the tides of war have chosen you to march against. The determination to reach for the future when the briar patch of the past tries to entangle your arms. The wherewithal, like Bartimaeus, to throw aside the cloak of our livelihood for the chance to be thrown on the road, the kingdom road with Jesus. We've gone over these things and over these things time and time again. What's been our vision, right? We said we want to encounter the kingdom of God. You know what? Encounter. We want to feel your presence, God. Have you felt that yet? This is a reflective message for me to come back and say, when we started this, come here, Pastor, I didn't even expect this. Look, we, we sat, this thing came together so quickly, it was like a blink of an eye. And, and he asked me, he said, well, what's on your heart? You want to get back into ministry? What's on your heart? And I said, all I want to do after everything that's happened, I want to encounter the kingdom and believe with all my heart that I'm encountering it real like we read about in the text so that that scripture comes alive and jumps off the pages. Amen. And that's when him and I started brainstorming. And that's when we prayed for a barn in West Springfield. <laughs> and one showed up. And we said, you remember? Like, wow, God's doing it. Uh, God's doing it, Dad. Like, we found a barn. And how many barns are there in West Springfield? There's only one, and it's the one we were in. No, I don't know. Right? But it, how much does that encourage our faith? Oh, it was like unbelievable. We were on fire. The fire was blowing. The sweet wind was blowing. The rain was coming down because we took a risk. We took a gamble. No, we're not at the slots at MGM. Don't go there. I'm just saying we took a risk. And when God showed up, it encouraged us. It bonded us as father and son, just like it's meant to bond us as brothers and sisters. And then we said, the winter's coming, and we don't have any heat. <laughs> We don't have any heat. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this place just appeared out of nowhere. Turn them out. I, I won't even go down that road. It's a blessing that we're here. Let me put it to you that way. And we were encouraged in our faith. Our faith has been encouraged because of risks that were taken. Because we believe that faith is an adventure. I would say, take it from here, Pastor Don, but either he'll be like, you didn't prepare me, and I don't know what to That's say, okay. or he'll go on for 20 minutes, and I'll no, never get back. No, but listen, okay. <laughs> just one other thing I want you to know about the barn deal. I get on the, I get on the phone with the woman who runs the, you remember this? <coughs> Ryan says, Dad, wouldn't a barn be great? I go, to barn? And barn yeah, he said, barn, yeah. So I call, I used to somebody here, I call the, the big E. And the lady says, no, I'm sorry, Reverend, we don't have anything. We don't have anything here. Every building is taken, blah, blah, blah. And she, and listen to this. This is where it really touched me. And then she said, I said, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you trying. And just as I was ready to hang up, I'm not making this melodramatic. This is just I'm ready. She goes, hey, oh, Reverend, hold it, hold it. I remember, no barn has been mentioned. She says, remember this, Reverend? I have a carriage barn, <laughs> but you don't want that, do you? I said, man, you don't understand. <laughs> this is beautiful. And I said to Ryan, I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, that's all I want to say. I don't mean to sound melodramatic. The next part of my note says, if this all sounds dramatic, it is. <laughs> Listen, because Jesus passes by. And here, here's some. I don't want to make it seem like you only get one shot to see Jesus pass by in your life. And if you, if you don't jump on there, you'll never get another chance. That's not what I'm saying. But I do have an equally important point that I need to make. Because when Jesus passes by, sometimes he passes by only one time for us to get a glimpse 
of the light shining on him in just a certain way, where a moment has been preordained by God and sculpted right. from eternity Preach. Preach. for you to encounter that moment right then and right there. And you may see Jesus again, but you may not see that moment when the light twinkles in his eye in that way at just the time you need it. Amen. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to jump on board, wherever you are in this journey of faith. These are the pursuits and the risks. Zacchaeus was just a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Sing it if you know it. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. We're the only ones who know that. Like that. Passed on by, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. Get you all go to Sunday school. Come on. Get you some Bible school. Something in here. Rich, we need some soul, soul in here. Something, buddy. Come on. Right? Listen. I don't know it either. It's like, go play Redemption Song again. Come on. No. But listen. That was a moment that Zacchaeus took and he climbed up the tree because he needed to see the way the light would shine on Jesus in that moment in his eye. <laughs> Bartimaeus was screaming out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And what did the crowds do? Crowds can be your worst enemies, brothers and sisters. Right. They can take you right away from your moment of opportunity. They can be the ones saying, don't go on that train. There's a much faster train coming. And all of a sudden, that train has passed you on by. And they say to Bartimaeus, quiet, quiet, quiet. You don't need to get them down. Stop yelling. And what does Bartimaeus do? He shouts all the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. A woman bleeding for 12 years fought through the crowds, pushed through, and risked being trampled on to touch just the hem of his garment. One man was even lowered through the roof to seize his opportunity. Brothers and sisters, faith is an adventure that leads you to rooftops. When's the last time you climbed through the roof for Jesus just to get a glimpse? When's the last time you fought through the crowds just to get a glimpse? When's the last time you pushed through adversity just to get a glimpse. What do all these people have in common? They were desperate for him. Desperate for Jesus. They were at the crossroads of life. And they were tired of the blue path of familiarity over and over again. Life had become parched. Right? Like 15 saltine crackers in your mouth at one time with no glass of water to drink. Yeah, you know. They were thirsty. So what did they do? They shouted all the louder. They climbed up the tree. They fought through the crowds. They lowered through the roof just to get a reach for that drink. Everybody here in this room, I believe we are all desperate for something. I am desperate for something. I am desperate for corners to be turned. I am de desperate for new pages and new chapters in life. I am desperate for the adventures of faith. Are you desperate with me? Yes. Every one of us stands at the great crossroads of faith, debating which trail to take. And some here may be like Zacchaeus. You don't know the Lord. You don't know the Lord. And some may be here because this is your way of climbing up a tree just to get a little bit of glimpse of Jesus. Not to see me. Not to see him. Not to even just to get a glimpse of Jesus in this moment. Some of you here, here to have a Zacchaeus type moment. Some may be here like Bartimaeus or the woman, desperate for healing or a new chance at life. Will you seize this moment to cry out? Will you forsake the crowds and reach for him? Some may be here like the Apostle Paul. Listen, because this is an interesting one. This one and the next one. Some may be here like the Apostle Paul, steeped in religion but for their own gain. Let me say that one one more time. Because if you don't know, before Paul was Paul, he went by the name of Saul. Some may be here, steeped in religion for their own gain, and need to have the traffic light at that crossroads blind them 
so that they can be turned to Paul. Right. Some may be here like Nicodemus, who knew all about his religion since youth. They went to Sunday school. <laughs> they were singing Zacchaeus was a wee little man. <laughs> they got it down in their mind. But Jesus is asking him to be reborn for the kingdom's sake. Know this. Here's a little asterisk moment for today. <laughs> know this. Jesus places the call to be reborn into the lap of religious men just as much, if not more, as the irreligious. Sometimes it's those of us who grew up in it and it's so oddly familiar that we forget the call to be reborn because we know the verses, but we don't know the man. To others like myself, maybe you're at that crossroads of putting fear aside. Brothers and sisters, that's my crossroads right now, to put fear aside. To leave the images that lie haunting on the side of the road. Turn the wheel to the horizon, knowing God is for me, for us, not against us, and step on the gas. And still others might be here today, like the thief nailed to the cross, right next to Jesus, just dying inside. Where the crossroads have become the cross they bear every day. Waiting for Jesus Waiting to just collapse before him and hear him say, right as they say, Jesus, remember me. Some people are here just to hear Jesus say to them, today you will be with me in paradise. Some are here for that moment. That's their crossroads of faith right now because their cross is too much to bear and they've been dying inside for too long. Encountering ministries... I am so in this with you. As people standing at the crossroads, hanging on the crossroads next to Jesus, wrestling with the same insecurities, the same fears, wondering the extent of God's love, wondering if life can be different, wondering if the risks of leaving our comfort zones will be worth the reward, wondering if it was all worth it, hoping that the barn and this place and heat and air conditioning, hoping that those miracles don't stop, Hoping and believing that he is for us and not against us. I went from really mellow this week to wondering if I'm going to have a voice to sing the next song. <clears throat> Before I close, last week I talked about Psalm 139. And in verse 1, it says, and uses the past tense, God has searched me and known me. And just to give you a quick brief synopsis, if you didn't hear the sermon from last week, it says, from the womb, from the womb, the psalmist writes, God searched me and knew me. Past tense. It says, as I get up and lie down, present tense, God searches me and knows me. And then he says, before I even say the words that I'm thinking of saying, God already knows them. Future tense. He knows my past, my present, and my future. And he still <laughs> grabbed us as the bride of Christ at the altar and said, I do. And the illustration I used was like a spouse. If you have a spouse, and that spouse somehow miraculously through all prophetic powers knew everything you've ever done, everything you're ever doing, and everything you'll ever do, and still looked at you and said, I do. And somebody asked me, <clears throat> we'll say right after, and said, okay, so what now? Like, what, what do we do in response to that? And I said, ah, that's next week. <laughs> because... Where we left off in that psalm, I am now going to pick up. In Psalm 139, verse 23, the psalmist writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Wait a minute. Didn't he already search me? Why is he asking to search again? Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me. Lead me on the way everlasting. Because the psalmist knows that faith is an adventure. And we don't just say, well, God, you searched me and said, I do. Now stop. The real adventure of faith is bearing your soul and saying, search me again, God. Know me again. Search me today. Search me tomorrow. Uncover every broken place within me so that I can climb every summit top in here and get and see the view of the promised land. Search me again, Lord. 
Don't stop searching me. Don't stop knowing me. Don't stop working on me. Don't stop healing those broken places. Don't give up on me. Don't ever stop, Lord, because I am holding on to you through it all. Search me again. And if you find anything that is grievous, anything outside of your way and will, lead me in the place of everlasting. Get me and leap me off the recliner and land me on the train. experience things with you. Yeah, I want to be taking the red path. The road less traveled, the narrow gate, the road that leads to life because I am trading in the uncomfortable comforts. I am leaving behind the hunting past of familiarity. Believing that in the end it will make all the difference. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we launched this out absolutely believing that you would encounter us in a miraculous way. I'm standing in that vision. Pastor Don is standing with me in this vision. Pastor Don, come up and pray. I feel the need in my heart to recapture that vision today. To take the risks of faith. To step out in the adventure of faith. Lord, you have two pastors here, father and son, standing united in one voice in this. But you have a whole congregation of people here. Lord, I'm praying today that we encounter you in ways that absolutely blow our mind. I'm praying for miracles, Lord, to happen in the life of this body that absolutely astound not only us, but are a testimony to people in the parking lot out there and in all this area. We're still praying for new people to come one at a time. We're still praying for those miracles that encourage our faith and get us to believe in what you're doing in us personally and in this ministry and in this time together. Lord, our vision today is the same vision it was back in June, to encounter your kingdom, to encounter your spirit's presence, and to grow in oneness with your son. Do something new in us today and give us the adventure of faith. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen.